Hello, I'm Tom Wilkinson, and welcome to the Thinking in English podcast, a podcast for intermediate to advanced level learners of English. The US, UK, and EU have introduced massive sanctions against many Russian oligarchs. These rich and powerful men are thought to have influence over Russia's leaders and policies. But why? What is an oligarch? And what is an oligarchy? Let's talk about it on today's episode of Thinking in English. Check out thinkinginenglish.blog for a full transcript of today's episode. And head over to my Instagram page, Thinking in English Podcast, for more excellent content. Here is today's vocabulary list. As always, the written list is available in the description of the podcast and also on my blog, thinkinginenglish.blog. Sanction. Sanction. An official order that is taken against a country in order to make it obey international law. For example, trade sanctions will be lifted if they agree to stop producing nuclear weapons. State. State. A country and or its government. For example, some museums are funded by the state. To skyrocket. To skyrocket. To rise extremely quickly or make extremely quick progress towards success. For instance, Housing prices have skyrocketed in recent months. To differ. To differ. To be not like something or not like someone else. Such as, my views differ considerably from my parents. Defective. Defective. Something that is defective has a fault in it and does not work correctly. For instance, my eyesight is defective, so I wear glasses. Perverted. Perverted. Considered strange and unpleasant by most people. For instance, he has a sick and perverted sense of humour. Corrupt. Corrupt. Dishonestly using your position or power to get an advantage, especially for money. For example, that country's police are very corrupt. You need to pay them if they stop your car. Disproportionate. Disproportionate. Too large or too small in comparison to something else or not deserving its importance or influence. For example, there are a disproportionate number of girls in my class. Tycoon. Tycoon. A person who has become very rich and powerful. For example, he made his fortune as a shipping tycoon. Newspaper headlines and articles have been using similar vocabulary since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In the last two days, the Financial Times has written that US to target banks and crypto exchanges that aid sanctioned Russian oligarchs. BBC have reported on Russian oligarchs, the mega rich men facing global sanctions. And the New York Times wrote about UK versus oligarchs. Russia is consistently described as an oligarchy in articles, TV reports, and political speeches. And the most powerful Russian men are described as oligarchs. These phrases have been repeated everywhere recently due to the sanctions placed on Russia and Russia's leaders. So, what is an oligarch? According to Google Trends data, a lot of people have been asking this same question. 
what is an oligarch and what is an oligarchy? Over the past few weeks, the number of people searching online for the word oligarchy has increased by over a thousand percent. Similar searches like oligarch and Russian oligarch have also skyrocketed. So today, I'm going to define and explain the meaning of oligarchy and oligarch, the history of the terms, and what they mean in the Russian context. I'll also introduce a few other terms for different types of governments and political systems. I actually recorded an episode a long time ago called "What Is Democracy." Um, it has a terrible mic, but you can check it out if you want. It's kind of related. Two of the best examples of modern oligarchies are China and Iran. Although China describes itself as a communist, socialist, or people's republic, the leadership and rulers of China are just a few powerful individuals. In particular, members of the Chinese Communist Party, who took part in the revolution in 1949. And the wealthy individuals who took advantage of China's economic opening since the 1980s have been described as oligarchs. Only a few individuals have power, wealth, and freedom. Most normal Chinese citizens will never have those opportunities. Iran is both a theocracy and a clerical oligarchy. That's some confusing words. Uh, theocracy is a type of religious government, and clerical refers to the clerics, the members of a religious organization. Since 1979, Iran has been largely controlled by a small group of highly influential religious clerics. The supreme leader, who is chosen by clerics and clerical officials, often have more power than Iran's president. These religious figures have the ability to approve or reject laws passed by parliament, and decide who can be elected as politicians. Oligarchy is a form of government that has its origins in ancient Greece. Aristotle, one of the most brilliant philosophers of the ancient world, spent a significant amount of time questioning how to organize the state and politics. He believed that the way government was organized was the key to a nation's or a people's happiness. Aristotle believed that there were six general forms of political rule. These six forms differed depending on who was the ruler and for whom they ruled. What does that mean? Well, the rulers of a country could be one person. Like a king, an emperor, or a dictator, there could be a few powerful people or families who keep the power to themselves, or the government could be formed from all of the people, all of the citizens. And whoever is the ruler of the country, they could either be true leaders who rule the country for the good of all people, or they could be defective. And perverted leaders, who rule only for their own interest. In Aristotle's politics, an oligarchy is a government by the few, which only has in view the interest of the wealthy. A few powerful and wealthy individuals or families control political power to make themselves wealthier and more powerful. Not to help the citizens of the state. These powerful and wealthy people, those with all of the ruling power, are called oligarchs. Although the main focus of this episode is oligarchy, I think it would be useful to quickly introduce a few other types of government. Aristotle named six, including oligarchy. For Aristotle. Oligarchy was the defective or perverted form of aristocracy, which he gave his own name to. In other words, aristocracy was supposed to be governed by a small group 
of the best citizens who rule for the interest of all people. However, aristocracy today does have a slightly different meaning. It's kind of more like oligarchy. The other four types of government mentioned by Aristotle were monarchy, tyranny, polity, and democracy. Monarchy and polity were governments in the common interest, while tyranny and democracy were governments in the interest of the ruler or rulers alone. When Aristotle was alive, states and countries were a lot smaller than they are today. Greece, for example, was made up of individual city-states like Athens and Sparta, with their own governments and politics. Over the past 2,000 years, a lot has changed in the world. So, do oligarchies still exist? And if they do, what do they look like today? Well, yes, oligarchies do still exist today. In fact, some political scientists have even argued that democracies and large organisations will always eventually turn into oligarchies. Most famously, the sociologist Robert Michels, or Michaels, I can't remember how to pronounce his name, uh, described the iron law of oligarchy. The idea that democracies will eventually become more and more corrupt as the leaders become reluctant to give up their power and wealth. An oligarchy can appear anywhere in the world, wherever politics is controlled by the few for corrupt and unjust reasons. In fact, there are countless articles online about how the USA is an oligarchy. And there is some evidence for this, as the country's politicians, business leaders, um, tend to be from similar backgrounds. However, the most famous oligarchy must be Russia. In fact, when we say the word oligarchy, most native English speakers will first think of Russia. All countries have rich and powerful individuals who try to use their influence and connections to change government action. But Russia is generally considered the best example of this. In Russia, oligarchs are the ultra-wealthy business leaders who hold disproportionate political power. The development and emergence of Russia's oligarchs lies in the country's complicated history. Until the 1990s, Russia was part of the Soviet Union, the largest part of the Soviet Union a self-described communist or socialist country. One of the major features of communism, or at least the Soviet Union's communism, was state ownership of certain industries. Basically, in terms of goods such as energy, food, transport and water, the Soviet government owned, ran and controlled those industries. Once the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, these industries were quickly privatised, that is, taken from public ownership and put into the hands of individuals. Influential and wealthy Russians used their connections, influence and power to take over these industries and become oligarchs. And this process was associated with a high level of corruption. One of the infamous examples of corruption at the time was the loans for shares scheme. A few wealthy business tycoons in the early 1990s were given large stakes in 12 of the biggest natural resource companies in return for loans to the government. The loans were supposed to be used to help an economically struggling Russia. But the government never paid the loans back. This allowed those wealthy tycoons to sell their stakes in the companies. And they often sold them to themselves for a large discount. The government of Boris Yeltsin essentially created a group of super rich and super powerful oligarchs by selling off the most valuable parts of their economy. 
from the year 2000, Vladimir Putin came into power and created a second wave of oligarchs. Rather than through selling parts of the economy, these oligarchs gained influence, wealth and power through state contracts. In other words, private companies working in industries like uh, healthcare, defence, uh, construction, were allowed to overcharge the government for their work in return for paying bribes or giving kickbacks to government officials. So, I guess in, in other words, the government would be charged 50% or 100% extra for the work. For example, let's say a company was going to build a road. It would cost $10 million. Well, they, the company would charge the Russian government $20 million. And then that extra $10 million would be given back. Some of it, at least, would be given back to different officials within the government. This created a whole new class of oligarchs. In the 1990s, Russian oligarchs had a high level of political power. Oligarchs could influence policy, often had official positions in Boris Yeltsin's government, and regularly exchanged cash for political help. Since 2000, Putin has taken almost all political control. He essentially told oligarchs to stay away from politics and in return he would leave their businesses largely alone. However, in some industries, like media or natural resources, Putin did pressure oligarchs to sell or return their companies back to the state. Today, there are a few different types of oligarch in Russia. The most influential are Putin's close friends and advisors people who he has known since his time in the Soviet Union's secret service or his life in St. Petersburg. These people, including Yuri Kovalchuk or Gennady Timoshenko, have experienced incredible wealth thanks to their connection to Putin. The next group of oligarchs are the leaders of the military, secret service and the police. These oligarchs have used their connections to gain extreme wealth and are now known as the Siloviki. Igor Sechin is considered to be the leader of the Siloviki, and the second most powerful person in Russia. And I might have pronounced Sil Siloviki wrong, I'm sorry. And finally, there are outsider oligarchs. These are wealthy individuals with little connection to Putin today, but who have largely been left alone by the government or their business has not suffered too much. Often they made their fortunes by buying those companies in the 1990s and then being quiet and not troubling the government since that time. In response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the US, UK and EU have introduced some of the harshest ever sanctions on Russia's billionaire oligarchs. Across Europe, mansions have been repossessed, mega yachts detained, bank accounts frozen, and even Chelsea Football Club, owned by the oligarch Roman Abramovich, is no longer able to spend any money or pay their players. I'll leave a BBC article linked uh, in the blog on thinkinganenglish.blog so you can read more about the oligarchs currently sanctioned around the world. The idea is that by sanctioning the richest Russian oligarchs, Putin may be weakened and encouraged to stop his war. However, as I mentioned already, these mega-rich oligarchs are not as politically influential as they were in the 1990s or early 2000s. The Silovaki, those oligarchs in charge of the military, security services and police, are perhaps more important and more difficult to sanction. So here is today's final thoughts. On this episode of Thinking in English, I have tried to introduce the concept of oligarchy to you all. 
Newspaper headlines and political speeches have repeated this word countless times in recent days. But few people actually know what an oligarchy is. An oligarchy refers to a government controlled by a few ultra-powerful and ultra-wealthy individuals who use their influence to gain even more power or control. And Russia is probably the most famous oligarchy in the world. But do you think Russia really is an oligarchy? Or is it some other type of government? Is your country an oligarchy? You know, you have to think about it. The UK, for example, is where I'm from, and we're supposed to be a representative democracy. But quite a lot of our our prime ministers and our leaders went to the same high school and then the same university. That seems a little bit like an oligarchy to me. Do you think sanctions against Russian oligarchs will be effective? Is it a good way to stop Russia's war in Ukraine? Let me know what you think in the comments on Spotify, the comments on uh, the blog, or send me a message on Instagram. I'm always really happy to hear from you all. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I really appreciate every single person who takes the time to listen to my podcast. Make sure you head over to the blog, thinkinginenglish.blog, so you can read the whole transcript of today's episode um, and look at some of the other content I upload onto the blog. Um, You can also check out my Instagram page. I post very regularly, um, and if you want to message me, I always reply to people on Instagram. Please leave a rating and a a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, Leave a rating on Spotify. You can do that now. And I'm trying to get to 150 ratings by uh, the end of February. Please recommend to all of your friends and maybe share on social media. And why not go back and listen to a few of the old episodes? It's one of the best ways to support the podcast. You can also donate on uh, the Thinking in English blog um, by going to the support page. Um, And yeah, have a great day. And I'll see you next time.